Welcome to the STEM Sessions podcast. I am your host, Jarl Cody. The original idea for this episode was to take a look at a couple personal examples in which demand outweighed supply by a significant margin, but then use logic and math to show that the reality was likely much more reasonable than it appeared. Kind of like a lesson, don't panic, take a breath, and let's look through the numbers. But as I got into it, this episode took an interesting turn. At the end of the original outline, I happened to ask myself, why does this excitement and warp perception happen in the first place? I was doing it just for my own personal curiosity, and it was an answer in which I was familiar with all of the components and the terms, but I had never linked them together in such a way before. And even though I had never linked them in that way, it still made complete sense, and I was a bit disappointed in myself that I you know, hadn't thought of that reason on my own. Again, this was initially just to satisfy my my own personal curiosity, but since I found the answer to be so intriguing, I just decided to include it at the end. This is the STEM Sessions Podcast, Episode 18, Supply, Demand, and Cognitive Bias. Here in California, our COVID-19 shutdown was quite heavy-handed. This included pretty much every form of organized recreation, from gyms to sports leagues uh, to pools. Even to, even the beach was closed. At some point, uh, outdoor gyms were allowed to reopen, and many of the traditional indoor gyms moved their equipment out into the parking lot in order to uh, see their clients. This also included outdoor public swimming pools. My gym didn't reopen, so I decided to take advantage of the pool. Now, again, because COVID-19 restrictions were still in place, the number of swimmers was very limited, uh, limited to adhere to the California's physical disting- distancing requirements. There were 18 lanes of the pool, and they decided one swimmer per lane met the requirements, although members of the same household could share a lane. Now, all sessions required reservations ahead of time, and those reservations opened two weeks in advance. And at least for the sessions I went to, all 18 reservations would be snatched up within 20 minutes. It was basically like a free-for-all like Ticketmaster was back in the day. But for any given session, there were typically three to six no-shows. You paid at the time of making your reservation, And no refunds were given, so there really was no incentive to cancel. You would just make your reservation. If you decided not to swim that day, you just wouldn't show up. The no-shows would then go to people in the in-person wait list a few minutes after the session commenced. So obviously this means demand for swimming was greater than the supply of reservations. But how much greater is the question? Given the speed at which reservations were gobbled up as soon as they became available, I wouldn't fault anyone for thinking hundreds of people were looking to get one of those 18 spots in each session. But if we stop to think about it logically, that definitely isn't the case. I went to the 8 p.m. session pretty much exclusively. And remember, I said that any of those sessions would have about three to six people on the wait list, and most would get in, if not all. So the demand was at least 21 to 24 people. The 18 reservations that were uh, reserved ahead of time, plus the three to six people on the wait list. It, of course, could be more because it's possible that interested parties just wouldn't show up at all without having a reservation and not wanting to risk being on the wait list. But I would guess it's certainly not more than 30. As COVID restrictions loosened, the pool changed to two swimmers per lane, regardless of whether they or not shared a household. So the total slots was now 36. They were still reservable at 8 a.m., two weeks in advance. And for that same 8 p.m. session that originally sold out in 20 minutes, it now never did. Uh, Spots were almost always available to reserve up to the day before. Demand was obviously lower than the 36 reservations in supply. And therefore, the math we walked through earlier was at least in the ballpark. But to those of us who participated in the process, the demand felt significantly higher. That's why we all set an alarm to remind us to be on the website at 8 a.m. ready to make our reservations. There is a similar phenomenon currently happening at Disneyland. Daily reservations are in extremely short supply, if any are available at all. 
and this has led to a lot of complaining and overreactions online. But this has never been the case historically at the Southern California Disney parks. Prior to the pandemic shutdown, Disneyland had a very popular annual passport or AP program. It was rumored to have over a million pass holders. The majority were of course local to Southern California and in the name of full disclosure, I was one of them. AP tiers differed by their blackout calendar, but as long as your specific tier was not blocked on the day you wanted to go, you could just show up and get in. Only on rare occasions, like a Christmas here and there, or special events like a 24-hour day, were APs ever turned away due to capacity limitations. Today, the AP program has been replaced with a new program called Magic Keys. There are many similarities, such as the tiered blackout calendar, but the big difference is you need a reservation for the day in question in order to attend. Reservations are available 60 days in advance, and different tiers can hold a different number of reservations at any given time. But if you look at the reservation calendar, November and December are currently wastelands. All reservations have been gobbled up, and they've been gobbled up for some time. Like my swimming pool example, demand obviously exceeds supply of those Disneyland reservations. And also like the swimming pool example, the urgency and the competitiveness would lead one to believe the demand is easily 10 times the supply. So let's use a similar thought process to gauge the real scope of those demands. First, no one knows the maximum capacity of the two Disney parks in Anaheim. While a fire code sets the limits for the restaurants, the theaters, and indoor rides, it does not set capacity for the overall park. That's up to Disneyland itself. Most guesses place Disneyland capacity around 85,000 and Disney California Adventure, or DCA, around 50,000, for a total of 135,000 for the resort. This could potentially be on the low side. I mean, I could see 100000 for Disneyland and 75000 for DCA being reasonable, but let's stick with that first assumption of 135000 Average attendance pre-pandemic was said to be 51000 for Disneyland, 27000 for DCA. Again, that's all based on educated guesses. Weekends tended to see the most people, with weekdays typically being significantly less crowded. Busy days were likely 80% the capacity limit, so 68,000 for Disneyland, 40,000 for DCA, or about 108,000 total. Now, I realize busy is a very subjective term, but I feel its use is appropriate with this explanation. As someone who visited the parks multiple times a month, if not weekly or more than weekly, there was a palpable difference between a normal day and a busy day. It's it's difficult to explain. You, you just kind of felt it. And this feeling plays into the way I'm estimating today's attendance. Remember, there were a million APs and no one was ever turned away. Therefore, daily demand pre-pandemic obviously never exceeded the resort capacity of 135,000. If it did, people would be turned away every day. Now, based on the busy day attendance, I think we can safely put an upper limit on the daily demand at 108,000, with an average daily demand of 78,000. These numbers include the non-APs as well, such as the single-day ticket holders, the multi-day ticket holders, comps, uh, cast members, uh, etc. Today, the resort is setting hard capacity limits via the number of reservations it allows on each day. It's doing so primarily because of staffing shortages. And it's also attempting to more evenly spread attendance throughout the week rather than having weekends above average and weekdays below average. I've observed the parks to be at least as busy as the pre-pandemic average, but definitely not busier than the really busy days of the past. So I think 60000 for Disneyland and 35000 for DCA are reasonable estimates, making 95000 total between the two parks. Because most days have no reservations available, I think it's safe to say that this 95000 number is also the capacity limits that have been set by uh, the Disney parks. This is the combined available reservations for key holders and single-day ticket holders, even though they come from different pools. Disney will sporadically move unused single-day ticket holder reservations over to the key holders pool 
and they're typically consumed within a few days. So this establishes the supply, but what is the daily demand for reservations? Using various Facebook groups and message boards as guide sticks, one would think the demand is multiple times the capacity. But much of that is just grumbling by former AP holders who are used to going whenever they wanted. I mean, an obnoxious minority of us rightfully gained the nickname Passholes for a reason. So let's ignore the hyperbole and apply some logic to the question. It's all but certain there are fewer magic key holders than there were AP holders. The AP program has existed for decades, the magic key program for less than half a year. If there were a million APs, there are likely only a few hundred thousand magic key holders, and that may be an overestimate, because a lot of people flat out said they're not going to get a magic key. So obviously the demand is equal to the capacity of 95,000, plus the magic key holders who can't get reservations on any given day. I don't believe there are any single ticket holders who can't go based on reservations because that reservation calendar is almost always open. Regarding single day ticket holders, I think we can assume it's roughly the same as it was pre-pandemic. Tourism is still down in the area judging by the local hotel occupancies, but some former APs have converted to single day ticket holders, so it probably evens out. Again, the old max capacity was 135,000, which was never, ever reached, except on extremely rare cases. I can think of three times in my tenure going to Disneyland that it was ever reached. The old busy day was 108,000, which was reached quite often. The new capacity has been artificially set at 95,000, give or take. If 135,000 was never reached in the old days, we know the current demand is most likely less than that. My best guess is if Disney increased the number of reservations to, say, the old busy day attendance of 108,000, there would always be reservations available the day of. Meaning daily demand, despite the online doom saying, is likely only a few thousand more than the current capacity limit. So if Disney increased capacity by a few thousand reservations, maybe by 15%, the built-up ill will would likely dissipate since the calendar wouldn't be slammed shut. Demand may be even less considering people are most likely hoarding reservations. When Magic Keys were first introduced, you could often get day of reservations. And if not day of, certainly week of. As we approached the holidays and people saw more dates fill up, they were hit with a sense of urgency, so they made future reservations without knowing for certain if they'd be going. And then when they decide not to go, they would just cancel the night before with no penalty. So now the question becomes, what compels people to feel such urgency to the point of hoarding in these situations? For that answer, let's look to another recent hoarding event, the Great Toilet Paper Scare at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Scientists at the National Center for Biotechnology Information, which is part of the National Institute of Health, performed a systematic review and a realist synthesis of data and studies of the toilet paper hoarding. Now, a realist review is an interpretive review of the literature which considers interaction among context, mechanism, and outcome. This is opposed to a systematic review that collects empirical evidence that fits pre-specified eligibility criteria in order to answer a specific research question. The realist review found the primary causes of the toilet paper hoarding were social cognitive biases, such as the bandwagon effect. Now, cognitive biases are errors in our thinking or errors in how we interpret external data that influence our decision making. In other words, uh, we give more weight to our own personal anecdotes than we do to confirm statistics. The bandwagon effect is a specific cognitive bias in which a person makes a decision primarily because other people are making the same decision. This can be dangerous because the person making the decision often ignores both logic and their prior experiences. And social media just amplifies the power of the bandwagon. It adds to the sense of urgency, the, the, the fear of missing out. And that is precisely what happened in the two examples I presented. Interestingly, today we often place a negative connotation on the bandwagon effect and other cognitive biases. But we evolve these tendencies for a reason. It was simply advantageous to our survival as an individual and procreation as a species 
to have these cognitive biases. In life and death and other urgent situations, cognitive biases actually speed up our decision making. If you see people running in a panic in one direction, the bandwagon effect influences you to run in that same direction rather than stop and evaluate why everybody is running. If you take off running without stopping to think, you are reducing the likelihood of whatever they're running from catching up with you. Instinct tells you they're running from something dangerous, and you should too. The bandwagon effect also leads to safety in numbers, which was important when humans were preyed upon by larger animals. Cognitive biases are a primal, instinctual, and advantageous method of weighing options when the choice determines if you'll survive a scenario. But in the modern world, where our survival doesn't hinge on every decision we make, it's more often than not better to follow higher level logic and statistics when making our decisions. Cognitive biases lead us astray in our modern lives. It's that simple. They lead us to irrational decisions. Irrational decisions such as hoarding reservations to theme parks. Thank you for listening to the STEM Sessions podcast. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Jarl Cody. Here at the STEM Sessions, we strive to share accurate and complete information, but we also encourage you to do your own research on the topic we discussed to confirm the accuracy of what we've presented. Corrections are always welcome. Show notes, contact information, and details of our other activities can be found on our website, thestemsessions.com. If you received value from this episode and wish to give some back, please visit thestemsessions.com slash value for value for ways to support the podcast. Finally, please remember STEM is not a tool exclusive to experts, policymakers, and talking heads. Every presenter is susceptible to unconscious and sometimes deliberate bias, so always verify what you read and what you're told. Until the next one, stay curious.